you all. Can you, can you hear me all right? You back? You guys good? All right. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited about this class. Um, Don and I have been talking about this class. Like you mentioned, we had, we've had lunch a few times. Um, and he was, he was talking about wanting to, um, to have an expert in to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, unfortunately, that person was not available, so he asked me to do it. Um, so, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. This, the, the plan for the next three weeks is this. Um, he's kind of explained to me that this, this, kind of, this class looks at big, big questions, big picture questions. So we're going we're gonna to approach the Dead Sea Scrolls from that perspective. Um, next week, we'll be looking at an overview, a broad overview of what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. So uh, today, you probably won't get everything that you want to know about the Dead Sea Scrolls if you were at all interested. This will be more provocative, hopefully, getting you to ask questions and using the scrolls to answer those questions. I hope. So, what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? If it doesn't cut it off that completely. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a group of about 900, over 900, Jewish texts. So these are Jewish documents. People always want to know, um, was Jesus mentioned in them? No, Jesus never mentioned them. These are not Christian texts. These are before Jesus. They were written um, and preserved uh, from about the 3rd century B.C. So we're talking about a couple hundred years before Jesus. Um, up until about the first century A.D. or C.E., so right around Jesus' time. So we're, we're dealing with that really crucial time period in Jewish history. These texts uh, were first discovered in the 20th century. So we're talking 1947 is when they were first discovered. They were discovered, um, it's an interesting story, I'm going to show you a video in a second, by some Jewish Bedouin, so some shepherds. Um, they were discovered uh, in caves, actually, um, around the area called Qumran. That's how you pronounce that, Qumran. Um, Qumran's an area just on the northwest side of the Dead Sea. Has anybody ever been to um, the Holy Land in, around Jerusalem, Israel? Anybody ever been there? Some of you guys gone on the trip before? Okay, some of you. All right. Uh, this is where we If you don't know, if you haven't been there, this is what we're dealing with. And if you want these, I'll, I'll open this too. Um, if you, if you want these, if I go too fast for you, and for some reason you want this stuff, these, these slides, I will be more than glad to give these to you later if you so wish. Now this is what we're talking about. So this is, this is Israel here. Notice, many of you have probably heard of Jerusalem before. Um, east of Jerusalem, along this, this Dead Sea area, just to the northwest corner, this is where the area of Qumran is. Now, we'll take a close-up of this. If this will work. Okay, back up. Uh, close-up. There were 11 caves, 11 caves that were discovered in the 1947, 48, 49, um, in the 50s. 11 caves where these manuscripts were preserved. Now, these manuscripts were preserved for over 2,000 years. We're talking a long, long, long time. These, cave, these manuscripts were hidden in these caves by an ancient hand. And you can see, no, the clicker is not working off. All right, the story behind this is interesting. These are, these are the caves. You can see the area here. There's the Wadi Qumran, this, this water area that, that flows through here. Up above this is actually um, a settlement, an ancient settlement of uh, Jews, and we're going to talk about that more next week. Um, but these were the caves. What happened was this group of Jews, uh, around the time of probably about 70 AD, this group, the Romans were coming into Judea, and these Jews actually hid, in some cases, this, this cave here, cave forth, they just dumped a huge collection of scrolls. You can say their library, these are their, their Bible, these are their sacred texts. They just dumped them there, um, thinking we're going to dump them here, we're going to hide them, the Romans will come in, we'll, we'll defeat them, of course, if, God, if God's going to win, um, and then we'll come back for them. The problem is, all of them died. They got killed off, and they didn't come back for them, and so these things sat here for 2,000 years until we dug them up. Now, I mentioned the story to you, it's like the story of how these things were discovered. It's very interesting, and I want to show you that very quickly. So here is the story. Sometimes history changes because of the smallest of things, like a lost goat. It's 1947, the year the State of Israel is formed and the errant goat belongs to a young Bedouin boy in the Judean desert. What is up? Thinking it's disappeared into a cave, he tosses in a rock, hoping to scare it out. Instead, he hears something shatter. Frightened of what might lie inside, 
the boy enlists his cousin, Muhammad el Dahid to explore the cave. What they find is a disappointment. No goat, no treasure. Just some broken pottery and several ancient jars containing scrolls wrapped in linen. Muhammad el Dahid gathers the loot and puts it in a sack. Not knowing the value of his treasure, he hitches the sack to his Bedouin tent pole, where it hangs for days. Eventually, he sells pieces of the scrolls to a shoemaker in Bethlehem for the equivalent of four dollars. They would turn out to be the tip of the iceberg. The first cache of what would swell to some 900 texts of profound religious and historical significance. Practically the only surviving biblical documents written before 100 AD. Today, the Dead Sea Scrolls sit quietly in the Israel Museum's shrine of the book, whispering stories of a distant past and speaking to the earliest days of Judaism and perhaps the origins of Christianity. Many of the scrolls contain biblical stories we already know. Multiple copies of almost every book in the Old Testament. Among them, 20 copies of Genesis, 17 copies of Exodus, 37 copies of the Book of Psalms. You've got every book of the Hebrew Bible in there, except for the Book of Esther. So they are reading and writing and believing the same things that we are today, with almost no details lost in the transmission over the past 2,000 years. Once people are exposed to the scrolls, something changes. To me, it's touching my roots. I mean, you look at the biblical scrolls, and history comes to life. The Dead Sea Scrolls are part of the greatest treasures, not only of the Jewish nation, but actually of human mankind. But the scrolls are more than a meticulous library of the ancient books of the Jewish Bible. Many of the texts had never been seen before. Unknown songs, mystical writings, apocalyptic musings about the end of the world. There was also the enigmatic Copper Scroll, which read like a treasure map. And most controversially, there were texts outlining the precepts and rituals of a mysterious Jewish sect that lived in the desert and saw life as a struggle between good and evil. To understand the impact of the scrolls, it's necessary to go back to the scorched landscape in which they were found. The scrolls were discovered in the Dead Sea region of the Judean desert, the lowest elevation on the surface of the earth. Here, the arid environment kept the scrolls from withering away altogether over time. After the first dramatic discovery in 1947, other caves in the area were explored, and fragments of ancient texts were found in each. The caves were scattered around an ancient site called Qumran, the closest caves only about 50 feet away. Some of the scrolls were recovered intact. Others had been badly damaged. They were written in three different languages, ancient Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Most were written on parchment, some on papyrus. One of the caves, designated number of... All right, so these, as you can see, the, this, the Dead Sea Scrolls have been described as one of, if not the, most important archaeological discovery of the 20th century. Easily, I would say. Um, these are hugely important. And the video mentioned that these weren't just copies of the text of the Bible. We have a lot of those. Um, we have text, we have the Copper Scroll, which is this ancient treasure map um, of where the Jews hid treasure, we think. Um, lots of different things, lots of different texts we found, but what I, what I want to concentrate on today is the text of the Bible. So, we found over 200, it kind of cuts it off there, uh, over 200, 230 actually, um, copies 
of the books of the Old Testament. Now remember, I mentioned this is this is not New Testament, so we're not talking Jesus at all. This is just Old Testament or what we call Hebrew Bible. This is what we're dealing with. Now, every single book, you have to believe, every single book of the Old Testament was found except Esther. Now Esther had a hard time making her way into the Bible. Anyone ever read the book of Esther before? You've maybe seen there was a movie on it too, I think. Um, Every book except Esther was found in this collection. Now, what's interesting is you can actually go and look at these things yourself. So here's a website. Um, this is DeadSeaScrolls.org.il. This is the home of the Leon Levy Dead Sea Scroll Collection. And once you can go and look at these, and you can look at very, very good digital photographs of the scrolls and see for yourself. You can actually read documents, materials that were being written and read 2,000 years ago, during the time of Jesus himself. These are the text that they were using. Now, so far, I know what some of you are, are thinking. You are thinking, really, who cares? Uh, because this is not big picture stuff. This is not the, the important questions that you might think. Um, yeah, somebody dug something up a long time ago. These are really old. Yeah, yeah, I realize that. What's the important part? So, here's how the, the scrolls intersect with what might be more important to you. Now, I'm, I'm curious. How many of you, this is, is this mostly, mostly freshmen? Is this, how many, how many are freshmen? Freshmen, so everybody mostly, okay. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, because this is in, in terms of Tuscan, the students that I have uh, in my freshman classes, uh, most of them are from some kind of, uh, most of them are usually from the South, but a lot of them are from uh, some kind of church background. So how many of you are from that kind of background? Maybe you went to church before, you're familiar with church, Friends go to church. Somebody goes to church in your family. You are you've, you've been there. Maybe you've even picked up a Bible before. Anybody ever? Okay. So most of you. All right. So you. This would be maybe a question that would be more of interest to you. Here it is. Have you ever wondered? And that's these scrolls help us answer this. Have you ever wondered? Has the Bible been passed down to us without any changes? Has the Bible? What do you think? Has the, the text that you use? If you do go to church. And your pastor, he or she, gets up and preaches out of the Bible. That text that they're using, they're preaching out of, um, when you go to chapel, even, um, when, you, when you hear the Bible preached or read, is that text, the one that we mentioned was found 2,000 years ago, is that text what the original authors actually wrote, or has something been corrupted, something been changed, has something, been, has something missing, has something been added over these years? What do you guys think? What you, what, just, if you were willing to, to talk, what would you say? If you will, take for a second, just, just amongst yourselves, um, with your neighbor, share, what, what do you think? Have you, have you just discussed this so far in class? If you want to share with your neighbors, um, if anyone wants to, to make a comment out loud, sure, share it. What do you think? Just the person beside you, for a second, just discuss this. What do you think? Which is 
a huge question, right? They, they decided long ago which books go in. Why did they make that decision? Um, we're going to maybe look at that in a couple of weeks. But that will be a really important decision that Qumran actually helps us, helps us understand. Right now we're looking at the text. What else did you guys come to? Anybody else? Good answer? All right. Have you ever heard this? Have you ever heard somebody that was very skeptical? Maybe, maybe you are. I don't know. Um, ever say this? The Bible's been corrupted so much. There's, there's so much corruption here that you really can't trust it. Because this is, this is a book written long ago, and things have changed since then, and, and the book's been translated, like you said, different ways. How can you ever, has anybody ever heard this before? Have you ever heard this argument before? Maybe you made it before? Okay, probably. Um, now, why? Why do people do this? Why do, why do people say, why do people raise questions about whether we can actually trust the Bible? Whether, whether the Bible's been transmitted to us accurately? Why would, they, why would they make these claims? And some of you guys raised some issues. I want to look at a couple. One is just the temporal separation. The distance between us in 2015 and the biblical authors. It was written a long, long time ago, right? Um, how about this? Any, any Office fans? Anybody watch The Office? Um, big fan of The Office. Um, the oldest books, and I'm, the, I'm, these are just really relative dates. Um, the oldest books, let's just say, they were written maybe 3,000 years ago. We, we, we don't really know for sure, but let's just say 3,000 years ago. That's a pretty long stinking time. 3,000 years ago between us and them, and even if we take the New Testament into account, we have about 2,000 years. So 2,000 years separates us from them. Some, what, I mean, something could happen in 2,000 years. If you look at this, and if you, if you like pictures, think of it this way. Look at all the time that separates us from them. What all could go wrong? What all could change in 2,000 years? That's especially important considering this fact. Um, how many copies, how many original copies, in turn, how many original books of the Bible? So the original copy of Genesis, or the original copy of Exodus, or Leviticus. How many original copies of the Bible do we have today? How many are extant today? Who knows? Anybody? This is for bonus points. Nobody. How many original copies do we have? Who knows? Throw out a guess. None. None. Yes, who said that? Bonus points. There you go. Um, no copies. We have no original copies. We don't have any originals of, let's say, Genesis, Exodus. We can't go back. You can't go to, to Paris somewhere, the Louvre. You can't go into a museum and say, okay, this is what the original copy of Genesis said. You can't check it out and see if it's changed. That's a problem. That's a problem especially because of this. Because of how the Bible came to us. The transmission process. The process behind um, when it was passed on from the original to the next person, to the next person, to the next person. How was it done? When the Bible was passed along, how did they do it? This is what I'm asking for. This is not rhetorical. This is what, how, did, how did they pass the Bible along? What? Spoken? Okay, so the, 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 the stories got passed along orally at first, right? And then what? After it was oral, it got written down, and then we have this. We have, I mentioned, there is there are no originals, so get rid of those. And for thousands of years, not thousands, but I guess over 1,400 years, the text was copied and copied and copied and copied and copied. The printing press was not developed by Gutenberg until about the 1450s. So we're talking a long time for copies and copies and copies and copies and copies to be made. Now, what's the problem with that? Now think about this in, in just, just big picture. If the Bible was written, let's say, thousands of years ago, if there's a big distance between us and them, thousands of years separates us and them, and it was transmitted by human copy, what happens when human cop humans copy things? Mistakes. Okay? Things get changed. Um, the text gets rearranged. Things get dropped out. Things get added. Okay? Lots and lots of things can happen. This could be huge. Has anybody ever played this game before? Anybody ever done this before? Who's done a telephone game? Done this before? All right, you know what it is. All right, what happens when you play the telephone game? Huh? Stuff happens. Now, we're going to try this. So, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to play the telephone game. I'm going to start, let's see, I'm going to start a message over here. I'll start one over here, and I'll start one over here. It's going to be one sentence, okay? We're going to see if you all can pass around one sentence 
without screwing it up. All right? Do you think you can do it? All right? Here's what I want you to do. The directions. I'm going to say it one time. You get one time. You get one time. There's a lot of people here. One time. I'm going to say it here, here, and you have to pass it along orally. You can't write it down. You can just speak it, pass it along to the next person one time. All right? So here we go. I've got to get my message out before I forget it. I better do that. All right. <laughs> It's not that long, I promise. I just want to make sure I say it correctly. Let's see. So, you got to get it done. Sometimes I'll play this game in, in, in my classes, and usually, usually it goes fairly well. But I have had one class um, where it went a little bit awry. Now, my class, the class was about 25 students. So it was much smaller than this. So 25 students sitting in the room, um, and I started the message. It was over here, um, and it wound its way around. And this is this is a pretty simple message. This is not like you know anything that crazy off the wall. I started the message over here. By the time he got around to the very last person in the back of the room, I said, okay, sir, um, could, you, could you repeat that, the message for us? Say it out loud so the whole class can hear what you heard. And his face turned red. And I'm thinking, he said, he said are you sure you want me to repeat this? And I said, I think so. Um, and then he repeated it back to me um, so everybody could hear and then my face turned red because it had just gotten nasty. I mean, it was just, it was obscene. Um, but I, I finally figured out who changed. Uh, there was a couple of guys in the back who were messing around um, in the very back. And they intentionally changed it um, just to kind of mess with me. So please, if you get the message, make sure it, it stays very PG um, because it is that kind of message. So where are we at so far? Where are you guys at so far? All right, come, come, let's see. Let's, let, let's just do this. We'll, this is, this is making it even work. Um, right there. How, how far have you guys gotten? Over here? Okay. It'll take forever to get between this crowd. So we'll, we'll come to the very end. The guy in the, the black shirt here. That's it. When it gets to you, you can, you're going to share it. Man, will you share it in a second too? Yeah. Okay, wait just a second. How close do you think that they'll get? How many changes? No, you're saying no, nothing. Not even close? Okay. All right. So you got your message? Okay. You got your, you got your message? One more person. Okay, one person. All right. You got it? Okay. What, now what did you hear? What did you hear? Okay, the farmer jumped over the what? The farmer jumped over the fence. Okay, is that it? Yeah. Uh, the farmer. Okay. The farmer jumped over the fence. What? Now, what did you hear? Hopefully, it's not nasty. The pig farmer jumped the, over the fence. The pig farmer. The pink. The pink, the pink farmer <laughs> jumped over the fence. Okay, that that was it. All right. Do you? The, so, so we got a, a farmer, a pig farmer, a pink farmer, jumped over a fence. Right. Do you want to know what the message was? This was it. The pig farmer jumped over the fence in order to keep the horse out of the water. So how far how far along did it make it? How far what did you, one one person. Yeah. He's the guy. So what did what did you guys hear back here? What, what did you hear? To get the horse over. So somewhere along the way, the horse lost lost the horse. How far how far did it make it over here? It got to you? Okay. All right. So you can see what happens when we, as humans, try to pass things along. Now, whoop, back up. What if, yeah, yeah, how about that? This is a 
verse you all know, isn't it? Genesis 1-1. Who knows this verse? Isn't this, isn't this a verse that you all... And this is a, a verse that you probably memorized in Sunday school, um, right? Genesis 1-1, the very first verse in the Bible. This is a popular verse. Isn't, isn't this the verse that you know? What's different? How do you know? How do you know Genesis 1? What is it, how does it go? Say it louder. Like you mean it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How do you know it says that, though? How do you know? Here's my question. How do you know that originally the Bible didn't read this? How do you know that originally this was the message and someone came along and did this? How do you know that 1,000 years ago this didn't happen? How do you know that? How do you know that the text that you're reading, I mean, you're on a Sunday, you're listening to someone preach, that you're using for a class, how do you know that that text hasn't been changed in maybe major ways? You can see that texts get passed along, or messages get passed along in this kind of way, things get changed. How do you know that this did not happen? What do you think? What would you say? If, so, if I came to you and asked you this question, how would you respond? What would you say? What? The Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, thank you. There we go. The Dead Sea Scrolls might help us answer this question. Now, what we're going to ask is this. Our English translation, so the Bible that you have in your hand possibly somewhere uh, or in your room or your somewhere, do those English translations actually represent what the biblical authors wrote originally or have things been changed around? Has something been added to it? Have things been lost? That's the question that we want to look at. So first we're going to look at the before and after. So before the Dead Sea Scrolls, what did we have? That's the question. First, this works. There were a couple problems. It, it, our situation in terms of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible wasn't great before the scrolls, right? What do we have? Well, before the scrolls, our earliest copy, our earliest copy of most books of the Bible, um, post dated the time of the books when they were written at least by about a thousand years at least, if not more. So we're talking about a long distance between when they were written and the earliest copies that we had. Now, the earliest copy that we had before the scrolls is called the Masoretic Text. This is the text that we use, and we still use most of our Bibles. Now think about this. Before this, this is what we're using. But these books were all at least written or compiled a long time before this, even before Jesus. That's a pretty, bit, that's a pretty long time. Now, in fact, thinking about this, Almost all of our English translations of the Old Testament were dependent upon one single manuscript from this massive tradition called the Leningrad Codex. For the most part, we just concentrated on this one text. Now, we supplemented it too, but for the most part, it all came from this one <coughs> manuscript. One copy. Now, that, that's kind of scary almost. If you think about, well, what if it was a good copy? Well, what if it was? The problem is we know that it had problems. There were problems with this copy that we're using. In fact, the same copy, the same copy that we used to translate your Old Testaments. Now, what were they? Couple. One, we know that it had errors in it. We didn't find them. And we know that it had lacunae. Now, what are the? Those are missing parts. I'll show you an example. Now, one, the errors. What kind of errors does this have in it? Well, one of the errors is this. If you have an NIV, does anybody use the NIV? You mentioned the NIV a second ago. Who uses the NIV? Anybody read from this Bible? Okay, so some of you. All right. This is what you would read if you read the NIV. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, that is, with the wife of his neighbor, both the, both the, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. That's in Leviticus 20.10. Now, the NIV is translated exactly like the Masoretic text has. Now, if you look at the New Revised Standard, though, this is what it has. What is missing here? What's missing from this text? Yelled out. You can speak. What? All right. The part in bold, right? It's missing that. You say, well, why is that? The reason is because the Masoretic text actually duplicates the text. The NIV kind of masks it, but in this case it says, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, and it literally has with another man's wife, twice. The NIV kind of masked it by making it this way, but it's the same thing duplicated twice. 
In this case, the new revised standard just drops it and says we need to think they omit that as an error. Or how about this? In terms of the lacuna. This one. Switch. How about this? Saul was 30 years old, is what your NIV would say. But actually, if you look at the new revised standard, does anybody have a new revised standard with you or on you or your phone? If you do, you can look this up. In your Bibles, it would actually say, Saul was dot, dot, dot. Think about that. In your Bibles, they would have dot, dot, dot. Can you believe that? Why would you have dot, dot, dot? Because we don't know what it really said. The Masoretic tradition that we use doesn't have it. It's missing from this tradition. So it literally has Saul was, we don't know. He was, we don't know how many years old when he began to reign, and he reigned, who knows how long. But the NIV, other translations, will add things based on other traditions. But we really don't know what it said. These are some problems that we have before the scrolls. Now, what about after the scrolls? What's the situation? What do we find? What did the scrolls tell us? Well, a couple of things. One of the things that we found, one of the contributions that the scrolls made was it gave us the earliest, earliest known copies of the Old Testament ever found. So the earliest copies by far, the earliest copies of our Hebrew Bible by far, these, this was a huge contribution of the scrolls. Before this, we didn't have anything anywhere close to what we have now. This was huge. Now, here's the, here's the situation. Before this, this is what we used, right? So we're thinking in terms of how this telephone game worked. If you got the Bible's compiled here, let's say, and you pass down copies and copies and copies and copies, well, all of these copies probably had errors in them, right? Or missing parts or additions, maybe. So all this happens. Well, what happens with the scrolls is this. We're using all of this first, but now notice what happens. We can get behind all of those so that we can do this. We don't necessarily need this copy, or this copy, this copy. We can go behind them and get behind them and say, what did these originally say? Much closer to the time when the Bible text, the books of the Bible were actually written. Now, what then do the scrolls tell us? What do they reveal about this text? Has it been changed? Has it been added to? Has it been subtracted from? What is the text really like? Now, I'm going to show you two examples. Two examples of what you'll oftentimes hear um, from especially pastors uh, and those who are commenting on the scrolls. So here you go. This is a very, very important question because how do we know that the translations that we read today in Holy Scripture or the Bible resemble the original manuscripts. Over the centuries, some have claimed that scribal errors were intruding and then there were copies of the errors and those got exaggerated so that today we don't have much resembling what the original manuscripts were like. Well, this argument is faulty. In fact, it's totally wrong. This was demonstrated in 1947 when the famous Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And in the caves at Qumran, along the Dead Sea, where they were discovered, they found a scroll of Isaiah that was 250 years old, even in Jesus' day. This was a thrilling discovery because now it gave biblical scholars a chance to compare the writing, the text of Isaiah, from 250 B.C., with the earliest manuscript version we have of Isaiah, which is the so-called Masoretic text from the 11th century A.D. Now there was a 1,350 year span against which to check the accuracy of the biblical manuscripts as they were recopied. The result, 99.8% exactly the same language. Deep in the heart of the Judean wilderness, now, how does that make you feel? Feel pretty good from that? How about, how about this one? Let's see. Let's see what these guys say. Roll of Isaiah. Now, Dr. Hassel, let's suppose that I take my Bible today. This happens to be the New King James Version of the Bible, uh, translated, given fairly recently. And let's suppose I begin to read a passage of Scripture. Let's suppose I read Isaiah chapter 53. And let's assume that I have Isaiah chapter 53 in the New King James Version of the Bible, 
And you as a Hebrew scholar have the Dead Sea Scrolls and you have it in your hand. Have you actually handled the Dead Sea Scrolls? I haven't handled the Isaiah Scroll because, again, it's, it's in the shrine of the book behind a glass case. But I've walked all the way around and I've, I've read sections of it. So you have read the original That's of correct. the Dead Sea Scroll. So let's suppose I'm reading here. You know, sometimes people argue that the Bible has not been adequately translated and transmitted down through the centuries. And, here I have a copy of the New King James Version of the Bible translated just a few years ago, and here you have the Dead Sea Scrolls of Isaiah that would date back, what, 100 and some odd years dates, before Christ? That's right, 100 to 150 before Christ. So 150 before Christ until 1960s and 70s, whatever, is at least over 2,000 years. That's right. So we have a manuscript over 2,000 years, and there are texts over the last couple thousand years that have been found by now. But we have a difference between what I hold in my hand and what you read of 2,000 years. And so I begin to read Isaiah 53, verse 4, about Jesus. Surely he's borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And if I read that in the New King James Version, and you read the copy 2,000 years later, are they similar? It's all there. It's all there, Mark. Every, you know, the amazing thing about the Isaiah Scrolls, it's complete. All 66 chapters of Isaiah are there in the Isaiah Scroll that come wrong. There, there, there's hardly any changes. Uh, in, in the, the Essenes had such a, a careful documentation, a careful copying rule in their community that we have a, just an incredible transmission of this, of this book. As an archaeologist, as a Hebrew scholar, do you have confidence that the Bible you hold in your hands has been accurately translated down through the centuries? Absolutely. You know, one of the things, one of the things that the Dead Sea Scrolls really show in scholarship is that the, the latest manuscripts that we had from the Masoretic text upon which this is based, the King James Version is based, was about the 9th and 10th centuries A.D. So now we can go a thousand years back to the Dead Sea Scrolls, where we have copies, as you mentioned, of every single book of the Bible. And even now, some scholars are saying they might have a couple of fragments of Esther as Isn't well. Is that right? So now we've, got, now we've got all the books of the Bible. We've, not all of them are complete. The Isaiah scroll is complete. We can look at that, look at what we have today, and we can say the Lord somehow preserved that transmission process through the careful work of these scribes. You know, I love... Now, does that make you feel good? Does that... Those of you who are concerned about these things and worry, well, possibly the Bible has been corrupted and changed, does that give you a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling? Because you're safe now. Oh, it's, it's perfect. Nothing has changed throughout the years. Um, well, here's the thing. Um, if this were a game show, and this, now this is, these are, these are it's what you often hear, maybe from a pastor or something like that, but they're wanting to increase your faith or to increase your faith in the Bible. If this were a game show, this is kind of how this discussion would go. And the host might ask a question like this. What did the Dead Sea Scrolls reveal about the transmission of the Old Testament? And then, as we had it in our, our guest videos, um, someone might say this. Well, here's his answer. The text that we have in the Old Testament has been perfectly preserved. As he, as he what was the percentage that the first guy gave? What was he said? How much of it? 99%. I mean, not, he said point something. So the Old Testament is almost perfectly preserved. Nothing has been changed according to the scrolls. Well, what would the game show host say? Well, in this case, oops, too far. Now I've got to pick all this again. Thank you. <laughs> and then his answer would be this. Eh, sorry, thanks for playing. But that's not entirely true. That's part of it. That's, that's partly true. In some ways, that is true. But not so much. It's actually kind of a good news, bad news situation. So here's what we're dealing with. The, the good news is, it is true, the biblical text was transmitted without any real change for almost a thousand years. That's true. So we can look at it and say, we have some very early copies, and they didn't change for almost a thousand years. Almost, they were almost exactly what he started with. So that, in terms of that, that's good. 
So this is what we're dealing with. We have the Etsy Scrolls found way back there. They're written way back there. They could bring us all the way up to the Masoretic text. And of course, everyone cheers. That's great. That's wonderful. Whoopee. We, 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 we've um, filled in this, this um, big missing part. Great. That's the good news. Here's the problem. What happens, though, when you, when you hear people like this discuss the scrolls, when they're just looking at, at the Isaiah scroll, because did you notice what text they mentioned? Both videos mentioned the same manuscript, which was this great Isaiah scroll. That's the one they're looking at. So what happens is this. We have how many, how many biblical copies, did I say? Over to oh, about 230 copies of the Bible. So if you have 230 copies of the Bible, all these laying on a desk, what if someone came in and pointed at that and just said, look, this copy right here, this one right here, this, you see this one? Yeah, that copy right there, it's almost identical to what we have today. Nothing has changed. What might you ask? Good college thinking students, what would you say? What question might you ask then? Huh? What about this stuff? What about this one? What about this one? What about this one? What about this one? This one? This one? If you only look at one, you might be able to say, that hasn't changed. But we have a bunch. And what we found is this. The bad news is, when we look at all the copies, we look at all the text, before the biblical text was standardized, before it became stuck and fixed, it was actually very, very fluid. Now, what does that mean? This is the, the second contribution that the scrolls make. They have shown us, by having all these copies, by having multiple copies of Isaiah, multiple copies of Samuel, multiple copies of Genesis, by showing us multiple versions of this, we notice the text was very, very fluid. Now, what does that mean exactly? What I mean by that is, we look at most of the biblical books, so Genesis, or Deuteronomy, Exodus, Samuel, we look at these books, and what we found is most of them circulated in multiple editions before the time of Jesus. So we're talking about multiple editions. Now, what does that mean? How many of you, and this is probably what you're saying, you know, how many of you, back, back, how many of you know this story? David and Goliath. Surely you've heard this story before. David and Goliath. Now, how big was Goliath? Anybody? Eight feet tall. Eight feet tall. I got eight feet. How many? Who else wants to guess? Eight feet. Any guesses? How tall was he? Nine feet. Nine feet six inches. Perfect. This man, the reading his Bible. Okay. Um, actually, his height would depend on which edition of the story you read. Because we have found two different editions. There are actually two different editions of the David and Goliath story. Now, I have, you have those handouts? Okay. Um, there are some handouts. This is, this is only for those of you who are interested. What I have is both editions of the David and Goliath story. So for those of you who are interested and you want to compare this, um, we have handouts for you to read if you so desire. If we need more, I will make more copies and get those to you. Trust. But here, I'll, I'll, I'll make copies for everybody by, uh, by Thursday or Tuesday. Okay, so you will have copies of this if you want to check me out and look at this. So how would we compare these two editions? What's different? Well, one of the editions, the one that's preserved in the Greek text, is 43% shorter. Now, what if I took out 43% of your Bible? Would you have the same Bible? It would be a little different one. How about this? How tall was Goliath? Well, if you read it in the Masoretic text, which is what you mentioned, 9 feet 6 inches tall. If you read it in Greek, though, he would be 6 feet 6 inches. Anybody 6'6"? Anybody, anybody six, six, anybody really tall? 6'6", six, six, okay. So anybody else tall? Um, you would be considered a giant back then because it was like 5 feet tall. But depending on which translation you use. So this is it. This is the Masoretic Goliath. And then this is the Dead Sea Scrolls Goliath. Depends on which one you're reading. How about this? How did Goliath die? Well, depends on which one you read. If you read the Masoretic text, he died with the sling and stone. This is the one we all know, right? Throws the stone, hits him in the forehead, he's done. Well, in the Greek version, the second edition that we have, actually it's a different way. He still throws his sling, hits him with the rock, forehead, but Goliath is not dead yet. So what David does is he runs over to him, takes out his sword, and slices his head off. 
He does it here too, but he's already dead when he does. So we have two different stories, two different editions of the David Glass. This is what the scrolls revealed to us, that we have two different editions, multiple editions of both books. Now, what does that mean? What that means is it seems like with this fluidity, with all the differences, ancient Jews weren't as concerned about every single word like some of us are. Some of us believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of the scripture, meaning every single word is inspired. They might have spoken those kind of terms, but they certainly in practical how they wrote the Bible, how they copied it, they weren't as interested in those kind of issues, every single word. What was important was the book. Now, if you're interested, here's a website you can go to and check all this out. This is what that is, is it has all the Bible scrolls in it. Here's the here's the, the, the site. All Bible scrolls, and it gives you all the differences. So if you want to go compare, how does my Bible compare with these other scrolls? You can look and see all the ways that these are different, all the changes that have been made. It's very interesting. Now, last thing, we're almost finished. The last thing that the scrolls give us is this. They've shown us how fluid the text is, how, many, how different it was before Jesus. But they also show us how the text was standardized. And how do they do that? Not only did we find the Dead Sea Scrolls around this area, we also found some different scrolls that, that you probably haven't heard about. We found a group of scrolls, and I'll show you um, here at the map. We found the scrolls, here they are. The scrolls that we found, the Dead Sea Scrolls, date to about the second century BC, so 200 years before Jesus. We also found scrolls in these areas here. And in these areas, we found Greek and Hebrew copies. In these, cop these caves, these scrolls dated to the second century CE. So we're talking a couple hundred years after Jesus. Now you say, what difference? That seems like a minor difference there. That's not a big deal. Well, what it shows is this. Before Jesus, we have lots of diversity. We have this edition, that edition, this is. We have multiple editions of the stories. But something happens, again, that question marks. Something happens here, and then after Jesus, we have this. Only one text remains. One of these texts is chosen, and it becomes the standard. It becomes the one that's the dominant one. Only this one is used after this. Now, I've got question marks because we really don't know why. We don't know why. Now, scholars, of course, have theories, but none of them are very good, actually. And we can just say we don't know what happened to do this. But what we do know is this. After that happened, after that change took place, this text became standardized. It became fixed for a thousand years. And nothing, hardly at all, changed for about a thousand years. It got stuck. That's pretty impressive, actually. So, here's the situation. We have editions, editions, fluidity, lots of differences, lots of changes, um, multiple editions. Something happens. This one makes it through. This one edition makes it. And what happens is this. It makes it through. It then becomes what we call the Masoretic text, one I mentioned before. It becomes that text, and that then is the text that you use when your Old Testament is translated. This is the text that you're reading from. Now, here's my question. Looking back and thinking about this, this situation, the whole point of all this, who's to say, in your mind, do we have the original words of the Bible. Do we have those? Which ones are the original words? Would it be these? How about this edition? How about that? This one made it. Do we have the original? And the second question is, who gets to decide which original we should use? Should we use, should we say, like this now, should we say that Goliath is 9 feet 6 inches or is 6 feet 6 inches? Which is it? What do you think? And I'm not opening this up. This is questions. What do you guys think? Who should decide and what is the Bible? Which is it? What do you think? Thoughts. How would you solve this? Are you reading the original Bible or are you reading something else? What would you say if I asked you that question? They want to pose an answer. Okay. 
Okay. What he said, you couldn't hear it. He basically said, society, is that what you're saying? Society is basically determining these, these issues. Or maybe, even, in this case, maybe even churches or Christians that are deciding which ones. All right? Is that fair? Is that what you're saying? Is that kind of the issue? It's sort of like, I guess, Okay. All right. Um, so if someone's choosing, then, if someone's choosing this edition versus that, Goliath is nine feet versus six, or whatever else, if we're going to use. The 43% of that one edition that we were missing. If someone is deciding those issues, my question then would be: Are we making up our own religion? Are we are we deciding if we decide what goes in and what stays out? If we're deciding back to who mentioned the, the, the canon a second ago? Somebody mentioned the canon over here. Okay, well, if we're deciding which books to win, are we just deciding this? Are we just making up our own religion? What would you say? He's saying, yeah, what, somebody want to take the, the other side. Would you say, no, no, of course we're not. Who wants to take that? Anybody want to argue that? No one's brave. Yes, sir. Okay, here we go. Okay, so the majority wins in that case, all right? What do you think about that? Yeah? I agree with that. It actually kind of places my point more, which is that the more exposure that we can get from a certain source is probably what people are going to end up going with in the future. Okay, fair enough. Can you repeat that, Travis? Yeah. Can you repeat what he said? Um, you say, say it really loud. Well, basically, because, you know, like Nate pointed out, if you have 10 of a certain of another text, typically people are going to go with what's more easily available and what other people they can communicate with, with other people on. So those that are more um, easily found in plural and more common mm -hmm. will end up being, I guess, the canon. Okay. Canon. So maybe you can raise the question if the ones who win are those who can write the most. If we can, if we can copy the most and get our, the most of ours out to the public, then we're going to win. Is that what? Yes, sir. Wouldn't it sound more like the Greek standardical area more advanced in like metric systems and measurements and all that? And, and measurements? Um, how so? What do you, what do you mean? I don't understand the time. Like I, like I would trust more the Greek with measurements than the... Oh, okay. the, the, the height of the black. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, they're, they're using a, a Jewish measuring tool, which is, you know, cubic. Um, but in that case, but it's just a matter of a different word in Hebrew. Okay, that's that's the issue. It's more of a which word is it, more than just the, the measurements itself. Somebody else has something. Yes. Sir. I don't really think it matters because people are going to believe what they want to believe anyway. Okay. Yeah, that people form their own opinions on the religion, and that it doesn't matter. Okay. So he said people are going to believe what they want to believe. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. I think it kind of also goes back to like which one's the oldest. Like, for example, okay, good, good. Like, if you were, say you're just like a regular person, and you're going to come tell me about the Holocaust, compared to like the DC trip this weekend, like you're going to somebody that actually like lived in the Holocaust. Sure. Which one do you want to believe? The person that's actually there or the person that's telling me about, about the use of um, whatever? Right. So I kind of think that's also another key point to look at the Okay. That's really good. He's, he's, he's raising the issue of the, the trustworthiness of these copies, these the ones, these witnesses that we're, we're using and believing. All right, good point. Somebody else had something up here a second ago. Yes? He wouldn't give us the messed up version. He wouldn't give us the. He wouldn't let it be corrupted. Okay. 
So if, so if God so if God loves us, which we can, you know, we'll, we'll assume that He does, and then because He does, He would want to give us the true version, the correct one, rather than the messed up version. Is that that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. How so? What, explain more. I mean, God didn't just write the Bible. He used people to write the Bible. Okay. So, you could look at it as the people who wrote the Bible were thinking that God could have a religious background whether they could not. And they could claim that God told them to write this and they just didn't write it. Well, that's what you said. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
thank you all for your for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Williams. Really appreciate that. Uh, can you hear me okay? Just real quick before we go. All right, don't forget you've got a critique that's due. I'm not going to make the critique critique due until Monday night. All right, because of DC and all of that. Don't thank me, just pay me, all right? <laughs> uh, and then I, we still have some donuts up here, but uh, the reason why we have donuts today, besides the fact that I just really love you kids, right? Uh, and uh, it's because of the Syrian refugees. And so remember, if you go to Blackbird today, 10% will be given to uh, the Syrian refugees. Uh, Professor Help has been doing this, all right? Can you say one thing? to tag on to what Dr. Williams was saying. This semester, we're talking about what it means to frame a Christian worldview. And one of the first things I said was, when it comes to religion, man, people can really cook up some weird stuff. And so I want you to remember this word. Why are we talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls? We're trying to find as much evidence as possible. We're trying to find the data so that we can say, yeah, we believe this, we think this, and this is why, and so he gave the example of, remember the Genesis 1 verse, and the kind of skewed, uh, you know, the kind of a weird verse there. Uh, you know, how do we know it doesn't say that? One of the reasons why the Dead Sea Scrolls are so important is because we can go back now, 2,000 years, and go, yeah, it didn't say that, it said this, and so it gives us more data, more evidence, as we think about the foundation for our Christian worldview. Make sense? I'll see you.